Okay, welcome to Architects of Change Live, which are conversations with change makers who are moving humanity forward. Uh, the kind of people I love to be in conversation with and connection with. And certainly, Dean Ornish fits that bill. He and his wife have just written this new book. It's called Undo It, How Simple Lifestyle Changes Can Reverse Most Chronic Diseases. And it's really here a wheel that talks about moving more, eating well, loving more, and stressing less. And that is the wheel of undoing. Uh, the wheel of health, <laughs> right? That's right. Welcome, Dean. And we know each other, and I'm a big fan of his. And I was saying that... I uh, got you, by the way. Thank th you. Thank you. Thank you. And that I was reading through his book last night and yeah. underlying it in preparation for this. And I wanted to begin with the idea uh, that undoing it is the key to doing your health well. That's right. And what is radical about that in your estimation? Well, my favorite key on the computer has always been the undo button. I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we had one in our lives? And now we do. Uh, and the book starts with a quote by Albert Einstein that says, if you can't make it simple, you don't understand it well enough. So I've tried to take the 40 years of work that we've done, yeah. showing that these same lifestyle changes can reverse. The more diseases we study, the more mechanisms we look at, the more reasons we have to explain why these simple changes are so powerful. Right. And so we started with heart disease, and we found that you know, with all this talk about personalized medicine, it was the same lifestyle changes, a whole foods plant-based diet, mm -hmm. moderate exercise, meditation and other stress management techniques, mm -hmm. and social support, or eat well, move more, stress less, love more, boom, that's it, can actually reverse these, actual, the, these uh, the most common chronic diseases. And so what, that sounds so simple, right? It is simple. Right, but I think people are like, okay, well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm working, I'm getting up at five in the morning, I've got kids in school, I'm taking care of aging parents, I've got a boss that wants me on email seven days a week, 24 seven, so it's yes. really hard for me to stress less, love more, eat great, relax, all of that, given the way our society is. It's true, but there are ways that we've learned over the last four decades to actually show people how, to give them the tools that they need to actually be able to do those things. Because the stress comes not just from what we do, but how we react to what we do. Amen. And if you can practice some simple techniques, five minutes of meditation, uh, walking, you know, I used to get upset because I couldn't find a parking place near the gym, you know, so yeah. I, I parked farther away. Just incorporating things into your daily life that really don't take a whole lot of time. If you, for example, meditate five or 10 minutes a day, mm -hmm. um, even get up five or 10 minutes earlier than you ordinarily would, mm -hmm. so you're not actually taking extra time. It's time you might have been spent sleeping, but you can actually get to a deeper place just by doing this meditation. Right. People often say things like, you know, I used to have a short fuse and I'd explode easily, but now my fuse is longer. In other words, I'm right. in the same place, I've got the same kids, I've got the same family, but I don't react in the same way. And you know, Elizabeth Blackburn, who got the Nobel right, Prize for right. uh, discovering telomeres, San Diego. and she and Alyssa Apple did a wonderful study, and they found that women who were taking care of parents with Alzheimer's, that the more stress they felt, and the longer they felt that way, the shorter their telomeres were. Right. And the difference between the high stress and the low stress women was to shorten their lifespan by nine to 17 years, huge difference. But yeah. what was even more interesting to me was that it wasn't an objective measure of stress, it was the women's reaction to it. So you could have two women in a very similar life situation, yeah. but one was coping with it better. They were meditating, they were eating healthier, they were walking, they were more social support in their lives. So we, we can buffer the effects of those stress and then we can accomplish even more and do what needs to be done without getting stressed and without getting sick in the process. So kind of the idea that stress is making us sick is yes. uh, a little bit of a new kind of concept. So people are like, well, I know that, but I, I'm stressed, yes. right? I'm, yeah. And I, my constitution is to react by ruminating, to have anxiety, to keep going over the same thing over and over. Yes. But the book also takes us to even... i myself. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> well, we've all done that. And, and the reason I actually got so interested in doing this work was I was suicidally depressed when I was in college. That was my wow. doorway into this whole area. That's how I got interested in doing it. And part of what I've learned is that it's really not what's out there. And if you really take it to its deepest level, yeah. uh, we're born fine. You know, we think that Amen. if, and we deep ourselves by thinking, gosh, if only I had more, you know, I feel stressed, I feel lonely, I feel isolated. If only I had more blank, more money, more power, more sex, more beauty, more accomplishment, then I'd be happy. Then I wouldn't feel so stressed. Fine. Right. Now, once you set up that view of the world, and our whole advertising industry kind of 
equates to that myth. Right, and social media. And social media, all of it. Right. In fact, there was a study that came out showing the more time you spend on Facebook, the more depressed you are, right. and the more stressed you are, because it looks like everybody has this perfect life but you. Because right. it's not an authentic intimacy. Right. It's like, you know, people don't talk about their demons and their problems with drugs or alcohol or what's going on in their marriage or their kids or work or those things. They just, you know, most people don't, at least on Facebook and social media. Mm -hmm. That's why it's a problem. But intimacy actually is healing. And so once you set up that view of the world that if only I had more whatever, then I'd be happy, until you get it, you're stressed. Why, well, I hope I get it. The stakes go up, because it's not just you know getting or whatever it is you think you need. It's like, oh, then I'll be lovable and happy, and, and I'll feel good about myself. Right. So until you get it, you're stressed. If you don't get it, you feel stressed. Right. If someone else gets it, then you feel really stressed, and it makes you feel like there's a zero-sum game, dog-eat-dog -dog world. The more you get, the less there is for me, very hyper-competitive. Mm -hmm. And even if you get it, it's I'm sure you've had this experience, I know I have, where you go, I got it, it's great, now I'm happy. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't last. Right, it's usually right. followed by either now what, and one of my right. patients years ago said, uh, I can't even enjoy the view from the mountain I've climbed, I'm already looking over the next one. Right. Or if it's not now what, it's so what, like big deal, it doesn't really provide the lasting meaning that I thought it would. So. Another patient said, I, the letdown that comes from accomplishing a goal is so great, I always make sure I've got a dozen projects going at the same time so I can immediately shift my attention to that. Well, what's up with that? Well, what's up with that is that's how most of us live. So the point of all of this in this new book, really, is that these meditation techniques and stress management techniques, the ancient swamis and rabbis and yeah. priests and monks and nuns didn't develop these techniques to... to manage stress, to unclog their arteries, to perform better in sports or whatever, it can help you do all those things. Right. They're really powerful tools for transformation, to help us quiet down our mind and body, to experience more of an inner sense of peace and joy and well-being. In fact, I learned this from a spiritual teacher named Swami Satchidananda when I was suicidally depressed, who helped me really use that experience of suffering as a doorway for transforming my life. And he, he liked to make puns. I like puns. that. Pause a second. I think that that's a really powerful thing you just said, is to allow your suffering, and everybody has suffering. To be a doorway. Try, to be a doorway to transformation. Exactly. So that is a very powerful thing for anybody who's out there suffering. And I always think that in these holiday seasons, people really do suffer, they struggle, um, and they, you know, it's for so many millions of people, it's a tough time. They're isolated, they're lonely. And if you think for a moment to just pause in a second and say, okay, I'm who Dean was many years ago. And I want to use that to transform. Yes. So how do you, how do, do, you that? do that? Yeah. Good question. I love that we're going this direction, by the way. I don't usually get a chance to talk about yeah, this. Yeah, we'll, we'll circle about back. About cholesterol and blood pressure and so yeah. on. This is much more interesting. For me, it's a, it's a conspiracy of love in many ways, because that's kind of the Trojan horse that allows me to talk about what's most important, which is what we're talking about now. This teacher of mine, um, people say, what are you, a Hindu? He'd say, no, I'm an undo. So part of the title of the book oh. kind of harkens back to that as to well. Homage to him. <coughs> that's right. Yes. But the idea is that when you practice, what in, whether you do it in a secular or a spiritual way, whatever spiritual tradition you do it in, when you quiet down your mind and body and you, sp and you feel more a sense of peace and well-being, mm -hmm. to realize that these techniques didn't bring that to us. That's our natural state is to be peaceful right. and happy. And perhaps the ultimate irony is we end up running after all these things that we think, oh, if only I had this, then I'd be happy. And in the process of running after all these things, we disturb what we could have already if we stop doing that. And so it's a very radical idea in the sense that our health, our well-being, our sense of peace, our sense of self-love are not things that we get from outside ourselves. We have those already. We're born fine until we define ourselves, stuck in all these definitions that really Somebody isolate us from other people. So what if somebody's out there and they're saying, look at, I'm, you know, suicidal, I'm manically depressed, I need yes. this medication, that's cool that he can say that, but I can't do that. Well, I came about as close to killing myself, uh, this was back in 1972, as you can without actually doing it. And if I hadn't got a really bad case of mononucleosis at the time and didn't have the energy to do it, this is before I met this spiritual teacher, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't be here. We, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So I would just say to you and to anyone watching this, if I can do it, you can do it. These are, they're, these are freely available techniques that are available to anyone. And part of the value of pain, if there is a value, is that it's to say, hey, listen up, pay attention. You're not yeah. doing something that's in your best interest. Change is hard. But if you're hurting enough, then the idea of why suffering can be a doorway for transformation yeah. is that if you're hurting enough, it's kind of like my teacher used to say, if you're holding on to a hot pan, you let go of it. You know, It's like right. or if you get tired, if you're banging your head against the wall after a while, you, you realize there are better ways to do that than banging your head, that you don't blame the wall. You say, hey, what am I doing and what can I do to change that? Not as a way of 
blaming, but as a way of empowering yourself. That's that once again very important. Not a way of blaming, abusing, criticizing yourself because everybody has that voice that just is banging around in there and beating you up. That's right. But as a way of saying, okay, I have the power to drop the pan. That's right. And let me ask you a question. To which organ does your heart pump blood first? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Your brain. That's what most people think. Uh -huh. Or guys might think a different organ. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, actually it pumps blood to itself first through oh, the coronary yeah. arteries so that it can then pump to your brain and everywhere else. Right. It's a great metaphor. So, you know, we get stuck in this, am I being selfish if I take care of myself? Or I have to be unselfish? You know, you, take care, you love yourself. You take care of yourself so that you can then share that love and take care of other people. And, and that you, you can't get what you don't have. Selfish. That's certainly for many people. Like I certainly was not raised with a Precisely. message of self-love. I was raised with a message of let get going, That's right. do something, right? So how do you kind of? Uh, Let's say that's the hot pan, the get going, do it, yeah. and the self-love. And I, I love that you put in here, along with eating well and moving, because we, here at this table we've talked to a lot of people who talk about you know what we should be eating and the benefits of exercise and how to decrease stress. But very few people talk about loving more. Yes. I wrote a book about love 20 years ago called Love and Survival that reviewed what were then hundreds and now there's tens of thousands of studies showing that people who are lonely and depressed, which I think is the real epidemic in our culture. Right, I couldn't agree with, more. With the breakdown of the social networks, real social networks, you know, extended families. Most people, I mean, 50 or 60 years ago, most people had an extended family they saw regularly. Right. They had a job that felt secure they'd been at for 10 years or more. They had a church or synagogue they went to regularly. They had a, right. uh, a, a neighborhood with two or three generations of people. And many people today have none of those. And study after study has shown that people who are lonely and depressed are three to 10 times more likely to get sick and die prematurely for pretty much everything when compared to those who have a sense of love and connection and community. I don't know anything in medicine that has that. Even smoking doesn't have that powerful an impact. But it also has an impact on our behaviors because in doing these studies over the last 40 years, I'd ask people, I'd say, you know, teach me something. Why do you smoke? Why do you abuse opioids? Why do you work so hard? Why do you uh, spend so much time playing video games? These behaviors seem so maladaptive to me. And they look at me, they go, Dean, you don't get it. You don't have a clue. I say, okay, well, what am I missing? They say, these behaviors aren't maladaptive. They're very adaptive. They help us deal with our pain, our loneliness, our depression. I've had patients say things like, I've got 20 friends in this pack of cigarettes, and they're always there for me, and nobody else is. Are you going to take away my wow. 20 friends? Or food fills the void, or fat cuts my nerves and numbs the pain, or opioids numb the pain, or alcohol numbs the pain, or uh, video games numb the pain, or working all the time is a more socially acceptable way of distancing yourself from your feelings. And so in our, in our intervention, we have support groups that are not designed the way that support groups are usually around some kind of pathology, but rather cre really create that lost sense of community. Because if you grow up in a neighborhood with two or three generations of people, mm -hmm. they know you. They don't just know your Facebook profile or your bio sketch. They know where you messed up. They know your demons. They know your dark side. Right. And you know that great line in, in uh, Jim Cameron's film, Avatar, it's like, I see you. You know, it's not, yes. I see of you. Yeah. yeah, it was really an African problem. Right, exactly. It, it, it's a, I see all of you, and I'm there for you. So in our group, somebody might say, you know, I might look like the perfect dad, but my kid's on heroin. You know, just use an extreme yeah. example. And so someone else, instead of saying, oh, well, why don't you send him to a drug rehab program like they hadn't thought of that? You know, it's like, oh, that must be awful to focus on what am I feeling and to ex express that as a feeling because it's our feelings that really connect us. Yeah. And it's so easy to make fun of that. Oh, that sounds so touchy-feely. And I used to get defensive and say, oh, look at our PET scans and our angiograms and all the science. And I thought, it is touchy-feely. We're touchy-feely creatures. That's what enables us to survive as a species. So the being able to express and receive love, to me, is at the, is, is at the one of the fundamental uh, underlying precepts of where healing occurs. Even the word healing comes from the word to make whole, and yoga comes from the Sanskrit to yoke or union. These are really old ideas that we're rediscovering. So is it your, which I think is radical, uh, we were by talking the way, about you know the word radical comes from the word meaning the root, the root underlying cause. Right. So it is really radical to suggest to people uh, that love will heal what ails them, and that love could heal depression, heart disease, and other chronic diseases. Yes, love not in it, not just love, but when you right. love yourself, then you're more likely to make lifestyle choices that are life enhancing than ones that are self destructive. That's right. And so in here, what, since we talk a lot about Alzheimer's, 
which is my passion, trying to find a cure, trying to help you think about your brain, think about your mind, and we talk a lot about some of the things, but I haven't been talking about love as a healing thing for your mind. So. <laughs> but you talk in here about change your mind, change your brain. Yes. And the idea is it's hard to get people to think about their brains because yes. they don't look in the mirror and see it. And particularly I find for women, when we look in the mirror, we're so sidetracked by everything that's wrong or that's meeting us in the mirror right. that uh, or changing about us, that the brain is the last thing that we think about. How do we get people to think about that That actually change your mind, change your brain, br uh, genes, change your mind, change your brain? That's right. Well, because to me, awareness is always the first step in yes. healing. And part of the value of science is to say these things really make a difference. You know, we think it has to be a new drug, a new laser, something really high-tech and expensive. Yeah. And something as simple as change your mind actually does change your genes. So, I mean, studies have, we did a study that showed that after just three months, 500 genes were over 500 genes were changed, turning on the good genes to keep us healthy, turning off the bad genes that cause us to get heart disease, diabetes, prostate, breast, colon cancer, By and doing so on. these things. By making these simple lifestyle changes. We're using these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific measures to raise awareness of how powerful these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions can be. And the radical theory that I'm putting forth in this book with my wife Anne, who's been my partner for 20 years, is that these are not really different diseases. That heart disease and diabetes and prostate cancer and Alzheimer's are really different manifestations of the same underlying biological mechanisms. Chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, changes in your microbiome, in telomeres, in angiogenesis, in immune system. And each of those is directly influenced by what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, mm -hmm. and how much love and support we have. So a lot of people say to me, you know, um, I know I hear you, you have people come on and talk about the food we eat and the Mediterranean diet, and then other people come on and they talk about the high protein, the ketogenic diet, then people come on and they talk about being a vegan, and they talk about a whole, whoa. <laughs> it's so confusing. confusing well, here's right? the thing, in this book, you know, I debated Dr. Atkins uh, many times before he yes. died of, turns out his autopsy showed he died of heart failure. Um, I did the Atkins uh, diet in high school. So you know. College. But now it's the keto diet. It's a right? keto diet. It's a paleo diet. It's the Atkins right. diet. It's the same thing. It keeps you know resurging one, in one form or another. Telling people what they want to hear is always a good way to sell books and magazines. And but so it on. works. It works in the sense that you can lose weight on it. Yeah. But you can lose weight on chemotherapy or smoking cigarettes. There are lots of ways of losing weight that aren't good for you. Right. But in right. this book, I'm taking the position of like, we've got 40 years of randomized control trials showing that the more diseases, we've shown that these same lifestyle changes reverse heart disease. We were the first to prove that. The first to do randomized trials showing we could reverse prostate cancer by extension breast cancer. We did the first randomized trial showing that we can change uh, length in telomeres uh, with Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, re reverse aging at a cellular level. We did studies with Craig Venter, who decoded the human genome, yeah. showing we could change gene expression at over 500 genes. And now we're doing the first randomized trial showing we hope to be able to show that we can reverse our early stage Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about that. I want to come back to, or we can do it at the end, because you talk about micro moments of positivity, which I think are, so I'll circle back to that. So you're excited about um, kind of launching a study to look at Alzheimer's. And many people, as you know, in this space said, you know, you can never and should never say you can reverse Alzheimer's because that's false hope to people who have mild or severe cognitive impairment. So I want to be clear here that I'm not saying, at, you know, and I don't know if you're saying. Uh, I'm not, let me be clear too. Yeah. I'm not saying that we can reverse Alzheimer's. Right. We're doing a study to find out. If you and can. That, and, and what sets my work apart from everyone else's is that um, we do research, rigorous randomized trials published in the Journal of the AMA, the New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, all the leading peer-reviewed journals. Right. Uh, Medicare is now paying for my program for reversing heart disease around the country. It took 16 years for them to do that. Because I'm, I believe that it, it's irresponsible to tell people something will happen unless you've first proven it in rigorous randomized trials published in the leading peer-reviewed journals. That's, that's what makes my work different. And so okay. people get all this conflicting information, high carb, low carb, low right. fat, high fat, whatever. In this book, I'm saying, look, we've done 40 years of work. Here are the references if you want to look it up. It works. Boom. That's it. So Here's let's, how let you me do just it. ask you, and I want to get to the Alzheimer's study in a second, because if you have somebody out there who's got Alzheimer's, I want pause a second, but when you talk about what to eat, yes, what should we be eating? <laughs> if you want to reverse disease, yes, an optimal, I want to reverse aging. If you want to I reverse want to age aging, well. yes. 
Uh, it's basically a whole foods plant-based diet. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, soy products in their natural unrefined form. What does That's that mean? That means it's low in fat, it's low in sugar, and it's predominantly just that, fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes and soy products as they come in nature. So like know. give us an example of a day. So, cause people go fruits and vegetables and, okay, so like what do you eat? Okay, and so. you do intermittent fasting? Well, I do intermittent fasting every day because I try to eat a light, a really light dinner and not to eat very late. So that gives me like essentially eight to 10, so sometimes you, 12 So you hours. don't eat after like seven o'clock? Exactly. Or, okay. I mean, so there are exceptions, but generally speaking. Right, and so just give us a kind of a, a day for Dr. Ornish. What does that look like? So people who hear soy products, <laughs> what is that? Okay, well, uh, for breakfast this morning, I had some uh, McCann's uh, steel cut oatmeal. Okay. Uh, and with uh, a pint of blueberries on it, because okay. blueberries are really good for your brain Correct. and other things. Right. Um, and a tiny bit of uh, soy milk, just to give it some uh, uh, moisture. Okay, and then at lunch? And at lunch or dinner, it could be, uh, lunch is my biggest meal of the day. Okay. So it could be, you know, some anything from steamed vegetables to uh, stir fry to with tofu. Uh, and then for dinner, it would be like generally a big salad or something along those lines. That's now, it? That's it. Now, for I wrote an earlier book called The Spectrum that was based on the finding that in all of our studies, the more you change, the more you improve. It's not all or nothing. If you're just trying to stay healthy, lose a few pounds, what matters most is your overall way of eating and living. So if you indulge yourself one, I mean, the whole language of behavioral change has this kind of fascist, you know, manipulative, uh, the words, yeah. you know, like I, patient compliance is such a creepy word, you know, trying yeah. to manipulate someone to change their diet or I cheated on my diet. I, it, once right. you label foods good or bad, it's a very small step to I'm a bad person because I eat bad food. And then right. if you're a bad person, you might as well finish a pint of ice cream because you're a bad person, right? right? So that doesn't work. And guilt and shame and humiliation are the most toxic emotions and anger. So in the Spectrum book, I said, look, w uh, and w so I didn't call foods good or bad because if you go on a diet, chances are you're going to go off of it. Yeah. And once you call foods good or bad, then it's a small step to saying I'm a bad person because I eat bad food. So I just categorized foods from the most healthy, group one, which are the plant-based foods, to group five, the least healthy, the usual suspects, you know, the high sugar, high fat, uh, high animal protein You don't foods. eat any protein, like steak, hamburgers? I grew up in Texas eating steak all the time, three right. or four times a day. Chilies, cheeseburgers, chalupas, steaks, no, whatever. No, no, none but of not, that. Not since then, no. Nothing? No. No hamburgers, no steak, no. chicken? No. 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 Fish? Occasionally. But? But not even, not very often. Maybe not very often. Once a month or so. Once a month. Yeah. Mostly it's, it's I've been doing this way since I was 19. And right. I feel better. Again, part of what I've learned is that fear is not a sustainable motivator, but joy mm -hmm. and pleasure and feeling good are. Yeah. There's this wonderful scene. Um, I, I was a part of this film that James Cameron did with called Game Changers. It's right. coming out. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, uh, I haven't seen it, but I've heard awesome. about it. There's a wonderful scene with a urologist named Aaron Spitz where they have these three athletes in their mid-20s, and they feed them a meat-based meal, just one meal, and then they measure at night the frequency and hardness of their erections <laughs> because blood flow is so dynamic, whether it's your brain to your heart or to your sexual organs. Yeah. And then they gave them a plant-based meal uh -huh. and then measured them uh, the next night. Uh -huh. And they found that all three athletes had three to 500% more frequent erections and 10 to 15% harder after the plant-based meal than the meat-based meal. So every meal. woman's gonna go put their <laughs> partner and their male partner on a plant-based diet. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> film, the film crew went on a plant-based oh, diet after oh, shooting oh. this. <laughs> but the idea that's is that- That's how they should sell being like a vegan or well, vegetarian. That's the whole point. No one said it that way. See, that's the like, whole point. And these, are all, and these are all world-class athletes who elevated their game by, by going on so a plant-based diet. So what does it do diet. for women? Well, it does the same thing. It makes you look young. In fact, Christy Turlington has this wonderful uh, website called smokingisugly.com because nicotine constricts your arteries. So in your brain, that could cause a stroke and your heart can cause a heart attack. But in your, fa in, in your, in your sexual organs, it makes you impotent. But in your face, it makes you wrinkle because you, you, your skin doesn't get as much blood flow. You look 10 or 20 years older. And it's the same, the same way with food. Whoa. But see, the idea okay. is that fear is not sustainable. What's sustainable right. is joy and pleasure and feeling good. Yeah. And when you realize how, and part of what I talk about in this new book, in the, in the Undo It book, is how dynamic these mechanisms are, how quickly you can feel better or worse when you make these changes. So and tell so, me. So it's not fear of dying, it's joy of living that really Joy motivates. of living. So tell me, uh, what are you looking for when you say you want to do a study to look at whether you Alzheimer's. can reverse 
Awesome. We are doing this study. We've, we've, uh, Is it we've, full? Do you, do you we, need more people in it? We need more people. We've raised all the funding for it. We're doing it with Bruce Miller and, and Joel at Kramer at UCSF, who are awesome. Uh, they run the Memory and Aging Center there. Okay, so who we're do also, you need to And, and to by the join? way, we're, we're also collaborating with uh, Rob Knight at UC San Diego, looking at changes in microbiome. Okay. Well, bless you. Yeah, okay. With uh, David Sinclair at Harvard, who has a Sinclair okay. lab looking at the gene expression and proteomics, and with Elizabeth Blackburn measuring the telomeres. So, so do we're you need people of certain ages to we join? Need, we need, a, we've, ra we've, re we've just started recruiting. We've recruited about 20 of the 100 people we need. Okay. Uh, these are men and women who have early, early to moderate Alzheimer's. Okay. Who live in the greater San Francisco Bay Area? Okay, so if you live in the, you have to live in the greater San or move, Francisco, or be willing or to move, move there. there. Be willing to, and you have to have mild uh, cognitive impairment, or do you have to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's? You have to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Okay, so you need to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's. You can be male or female. You have to live in the San Francisco area. And if, you and if you think you might have Alzheimer's, we will uh, do the cognitive function testing on you to see if you have an independent, if necessary, a PET scan to see if we can document that. Okay, and We're then you follow them for how long? So we have 100 men and women. We'll randomly divide them into two groups. One group will get the intensive intervention for four months. We'll do baseline testing on both groups. We'll do it for four months, and it'll be the same lifestyle intervention that we found that could reverse heart disease and diabetes and prostate cancer, you know, the same things that we write about in this book. And then we'll test both groups again after four months. Then the first group that didn't get the program, the control group, will cross over. They'll get it for four months. Okay. The first group will get it for four additional months for a total of eight months, and we'll test them the third time after eight months. Uh, and Luis Saihoyos, who got an Academy Award for The Cove, which was right, a right. fantastic documentary and did right, the Game right. Changers documentary, will be documenting, uh, will be following the patients in our study all the way through as well. And do, what about the role of supplements in all of that? Are you a believer in that? Yes, or? we're giving them some supplements. We're giving them some uh, turmeric, some CoQ10, so a good multivitamin, some vitamin C, uh, some, I think, uh, some magnesium. I, I think that's it. But the supplements are just that. They're, they're supplements. They don't take the place of other things. And they're going to be on a whole kind of whole food diet. Whole Same diet, and we're giving them all 21 meals a week for them and their caregiver. It's all done for free to the Pearson. It's all done through our nonprofit institute in collaboration wow. with UCSF. Wow. And so the point is, is that whatever we show, it'll be of interest. If yes, we, we, I think we're at exactly. a place with Alzheimer's that we were 40 years ago with heart disease, that there's every reason to think it'll work, but no one's really done it in a rigorous way. Right. Uh, there, if you look at the finger study, you know, show that yes. less intensive interventions, which are now morphed into the pointer study in the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, the men study, the mind study, the anecdotal studies show that less intensive interventions can slow or stop the progression. More intensive interventions anecdotally may make a difference, but no one's done it in a systematic, randomized trial. And so whatever we show And those studies that uh, Dr. Ornish was talking about were really are talking about lifestyle things that you can do. That's right. Uh, These that same are lifestyle changes. Your, uh, in your power. So it'll be interesting to watch how that unfolds. And if you are struggling with any kind of mild cognitive impairment or any memory issues, there are things you can do and you're not living in San Francisco, <laughs> you're not in this trial, That's right. that many people think uh, do have impact in slowing the progression of cognitive impairment that involve eating well, All of these exercising things. more, decreasing your stress, loving more, and just understanding that your brain, like your waistline, is malleable. That's right. Right? All of these things are so much more malleable, so much more dynamic than we had once realized. You know. And talk to me a minute for about this. For better and for worse. You I can get worse quickly as well as better yeah, quickly. Yeah. So um, I'm not going to say put down <laughs> your... I like French fries. <laughs> but um, I liked this thing. You talk about Dr. Barbara Fredrickson. Um, and I just thought that this kind of micro moments of positivity. Yes. And I thought that's really achievable. Yes. We were so talk a little bit about that. Well, we were both speaking at a conference conference on happiness. It was the first right. conference on happiness in Austin. And she was just talking about, you know, focus on things that really make a difference in your life, that we, we can direct our awareness to, we can go to these really dark places, but we can also go to healing places. And it doesn't take that long. We have a lot more choice about our feelings. Again, not right. to blame, but to empower. And having experienced the most dark and horrible place when I was so profoundly depressed when I was in college, the worst thing about being depressed is that you feel like it's a, it's a true reality distortion field. You think you're really seeing things clearly for the first time when you're really depressed. That, that things are bad, they've always been bad, and any time you ever thought that they'd be better, you were just fooling yourself. That's what, where the helplessness and hopelessness that's really a hallmark yeah. of depression come from. It's from that distortion. And so what meditation and what 
support groups and the kinds of things that I write about in this book, and for that matter, even changing your diet can do and exercise, is it can reframe that for you and give you those micro moments and more than just micro moments of real clarity and, and, and to quiet down our mind and body enough to experience more of an inner sense of peace and joy and well-being and to realize that's really who we are. That's our natural state. And then and then we don't have to, and then when you're, you're grounded in that state, the paradox, you can go out in the world and accomplish even more, but right. the intention behind it is very different. It's coming from a place of service, not I have to do these things so that people will love and respect me. Because yeah. then the stresses go way up and that's when things really get dark. I love that idea of like knowing why you're going out to do what you did. I just saw over the weekend the movie Free Solo, which talks about this young man climbing uh, El Capitan. Capitan right? Oh, I, so I heard him speak at the TED conference. Oh, you did, yeah. So yeah. it was so, but it was really also about like, why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. And and really, the the question for all of us um, is, you know, why are we? I saw that back to back with the movie Creed, which is why are you walking into the ring? Right. And why are any of us? doing, I think that is... I'm so glad to talk to you because this is also what the book is about, which is that <clears throat> I got in the habit of asking people, um, why do you want to live longer? You know, people assume that everybody wants to live longer. But right. if you told me when I was about to kill myself that you're going to live longer, I'd say, you don't get it. I don't know if I can... Just, and yeah. a lot of people, just getting through the day is really the issue. Yeah, you exactly. Know? And so... Victor Frankl wrote a wonderful book 60 years ago called Man's Search for Meaning yeah. about, I'm sure you're familiar about yeah. concentration camp survivors in right. World War II. And what he found was it wasn't the strongest and the healthiest that survived. It was the ones who had the strongest sense of meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. You could have two people in the same bunker. One, was, one survived and one didn't. And it was the one who said, I've got to survive so that I can whatever, can be reunited right. with my loved ones or bear witness or write a book or whatever. Right. So if, you're, if you can help a person get remind themselves about why, what is their purpose in life? What brings them a sense of meaning? What brings them a sense of joy? And connect to that. Then I find that you create these virtuous cycles and people are much more likely to make lifestyle changes that are healing than ones that are harmful. But I find that so many people, and I don't know if, you know, they'll say like, I want to find my purpose, but I can't. And you telling me to find my purpose stresses me out because I can't figure out what my purpose is and I feel really bad that I don't have my purpose. Well, you can, so there's there's that, yes. right? And so I, I tried to I think, I said, well, what brings you meaning? Right. Yes. Right? I have written this book. I've been thinking, you know, the reflections, prayers, and meditations for a meaningful life. So yes. kind of what brings you meaning on a daily basis, right? This I love is, that. Yeah. So mm. it's maybe, and I don't know, but it's kind of the idea of, what gets you up? Why are we, why do I do this? Why do you do that? Yes. Why do you do this? Well, this is what brings me a sense of meaning, you know, and meaning is healing. Uh, if you can help someone get in touch with their sense of meaning, and what I, a very powerful technique that I found that I talk about in this book is that we all have an inner guru, an inner teacher, an inner, the, sometimes called the still small voice within, you know. Right. The and an the, inner critic. I also an inner critic, but it's yes. the still small voice within that speaks very clearly but very quietly. The inner critic is the one that's jabbering all day. Yeah. But it's the one that, the, the still small voice within is the one that wakes you up at three in the morning and says, hey, Dean, listen up, pay attention. You're not doing something that's in your best interest. And you can access that voice very intentionally. So at the end of a Whatever way you meditate, whether it's secular or whether it's spiritual, uh, whether it's religious, when your mind uh, is more quiet down, mm -hmm. you can ask that part of you to identify itself to you. Just say hello, and, and it will, and it will. And you say, okay, I've gotten in the habit of saying, what am I not paying attention to that I need to pay attention to, mm -hmm. and what's going to bring me the greatest sense of meaning and joy today? What do I need to do to do that? And just listen, and it will tell you. It will speak very clearly, but very quietly. And and I just found that. Uh, and I can do that now in the midst of a busy day, even, you know, but if you do that as a matter of practice every day, you learn to recognize that voice. And that voice will tell you what brings you the sense of meaning and joy and purpose and, and, and happiness. And in, in order to do that, I think one of the other things that kind of we learned from teachers of centuries ago is stillness. Yes. Um, you can't hear that voice if you're on Facebook or watching this for that Precisely. matter. <laughs> or just busying yourself. And so one of the things I think for type A personalities is, and others, is to allow yourself stillness. That's right. And quiet. That's right. Uh, to hear that voice. And uh, you might hear it in your suffering. Once again, that might give you your door. That's right. To transformation. But I think the overall thing about all of this, which is what is exciting, is that uh, your 
in control. That's right. You have the power. You are not helpless, right? And you can just put the, I'm a big believer in wheels, uh, actually, because <laughs> I think they're, they're visuals. Yes. And they're easy to follow and kind of, you can, you know, put this up on your refrigerator. You can put it up on your mirror. Oh, I and love that. It can remind you that you're the hub of your wheel. That's and right. And that these are the things to do. And these are also different undo arrows as well that are all connected. You know, the undo button on the computer has that right, arrow. Right, 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 right. And um, I think it's easier to kind of think, oh, for me anyway, about what I can do. Exactly. Uh, as well as undo. Exactly, yes. Do, undo, whatever. Anyway, the book is called Undo It! <laughs> exclamation like now. Undo it now. <laughs> Move more. Eat well. Love more. Stress less. How Simple Lifestyle Changes Can Reverse Most Chronic Diseases. It actually comes out in January, so you can pre-order it on Amazon. Thank you. And uh, it's got recipes in it. It's got a lot of facts. It's got some pictures, drawings, all kinds of stuff on it. So that's the book. It's colorful. It's going to be hardback, so this is just, right? The galley proof. Yeah, right. this is just the galley proof. Um, but Dr. Dean Ornish and uh, your wife, Ann Ornish, are the authors. And I think it's going to be exciting to see what you come up with Thank you. at UCSF on that um, Alzheimer's because we've gone from thinking that it's going to be uphill or a discovery to that it you know might be multiple things, that it's lifestyle, that right. we, uh, there's so much we're learning and we don't know. And we're also, I hope you'll look at how women in that study might be different. That's right. That. We are going to be looking at that. In, yeah. fact, in fact, Leonard Lauder, who started the Alzheimer's yes, Drug Discovery, Discovery Foundation, right. this is the first time they've given a large grant for a non-drug intervention. Great. Well, so. there you go. Well, I hope you'll work with the Women's Alzheimer's Movement. We'd love to. We come visit us and, uh, and come I see will. what we I will. I love Bruce Miller, and we're big fans of his and big fans of yours. So thank, thank you. you. And thank you all for joining us. Thank, thank you. you.